Hi, my name is Annamika Vandenhoevel and I'm from the University of Queensland. And here at Heron Island we are looking at the effects of climate change on coral reef ecosystems. So you've used this setup for, to run our two different experiments. Could you explain the first experiment, uh, how you designed it and what you were trying to find out from it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so this experiment is run by Sophie Darvin of Hogelberg. And what we did for the first experiment was we had four different scenarios. So we wanted to see what was the impact of climate change. So to do that, we didn't want to just look into the future, we also wanted to look into the past to see whether it's changed already. So the first treatment we had was a pre-industrial treatment where we rolled back the clock and we'd reduce the temperature and we reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which means we reduce the carbon dioxide in the water, which meant that the pH wasn't quite so low. So there's a change in pH, slightly higher and slightly lower temperatures. We then had the today treatment, so same conditions as what we had today. Now what's really great about the experiment is that we have a buoy sitting out off Heron Island that records temperature and the acidity and everything in the ocean, and we have access to that data. So we put that into a computer program, and that computer program runs and meets those temperatures every hour throughout the day. So we get daily fluctuations, we get yearly fluctuations, so rather than having a stagnant one set temperature, we have a nice little curve going on, which is great. Um, we have heated chillers to do that for us, so um, keeps it going. So then to look into the future, we had two different scenarios. We had what we called the do something scenario, which was reducing our emissions, and that resulted in about a two degree increase and a decrease in the um, PCO2 in the water. We then had the business as usual scenario. So this was no reducing emissions, we just keep producing as we have been. This one resulted in about a four degree increase in temperature and a higher increase in the PCO2. Um, we ran that for about 18 months and the results from that were quite startling. So the pre-industrial and the control both survived quite well. The pre-industrial did seem to do a little bit better in the productivity, um, but the control reef did look fairly happy. But then when you start to look at the two future scenarios, things didn't look quite so good. The um, do something scenario, in the first summer, we had all the coral bleach, so they lost their symbionts, they weren't able to photosynthesize anymore. Um, and then during the summer, some of those coral died. But some of them actually survived in their bleach state. Um, so one of the brain corals did, we had a priority survive, and some fungia. And then during the winter period, they were actually able to recover some of their color and pigmentation, um, which was really great to see. And then again, the next following summer, they bleached but they were alive, they were in there, and calcification was occurring in those tanks. When you then went to the do nothing scenario, it was even worse. You had everything bleach for the, during the first summer, and then everything in there died. And that was the same state throughout the whole 18 months after they died. And that included the algae, there wasn't much algae in there, um, or the coral were dead, and you basically had cyanobacteria taking over. And what was worse was that there was no calcification occurring. So we had net decalcification happening, which means for our future reefs that not only are the reefs lost, but we're losing the habitat for other organisms because there's no reef structure, and we're also losing coastal protection for um, human communities and things like that. So then we looked at um, what was causing temperature or PCO2. They're unlikely not to occur together, but we would like to tease that out a little bit. So that leads us to today's experiment, and again we've got the four treatments. Um, the blue treatments here is, again, our control treatment, so today's temperature and PCO2. We have our red treatment, which is um, the increased temperature and PCO2. We have our green treatments, which is increased PCO2. And then we have the yellow treatments, which is increased temperature. But those two maintain today's of the other value. So the red treatment is the do-nothing. It is the do-nothing of the last experiment, yeah. So this tank uh, does not have a very bright future. So, and this is equivalent to the do nothing in your first experiment? That's right. This is going to be exactly the same as doing that experiment in this tank. Right. Yeah. So, and so the purpose of this new experiment is to tease apart the relative contributions of either CO2 or warming to impacting corals? Yeah, kind of see what effect individually those two aspects have. Um, so we've seen what happens together. Does the same thing happen separately? So we'll see in about a year's time. <laughs> so what does the, did the first experiment tell you about coral's ability to uh, adapt or recover from, from acidification and from bleaching? 
What was scary about the first experiment is that corals don't seem to have adapted fully to today's conditions. So the pre-industrial did do better than the control treatment. So that means that from pre-industrial times to today, they haven't adapted. So the projecting that into the future, if they haven't adapted to today's conditions, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to adapt to the rapidly changing and increasing temperatures in PCO2. So much better to reduce as much as we can now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, um, given the, the effects you, you see from your experiments on corals, what, uh, I guess, how would those effects then ripple through um, ocean ecosystems more generally? Well, coral reefs are a nursery ground, just like mangroves and that are. So many organisms breed in those regions and then spread out from there. So you lose your coral reefs, you're going to lose a lot of fish stock, you're going to lose a lot of species. So that's going to obviously impact on humans in food resources. It's also going to impact us on protection. So the reef provides an area of protection for us from storm surges and cyclones and things like that. So it prevents the big washes onto land. As we lose that reef structure, we're also going to lose that protection. So you're going to have a lot more impact onto coastal regions and coastal areas due to that loss of protection. Uh, one of the experiment designers, uh, Ove Hogelberg, he, um, he talks about these two uh, impacts, uh, acidification and warming, as like a one-two punch. Mm. Uh, looking at each one individually, could you explain how um, specifically warming temperatures in the water, how, how exactly does that affect corals? Well, corals are very temperature sensitive. So you can have a one degree change over the average yearly temperature and that will affect the coral already. So that's not much of a buffer zone there. Um, when you increase the temperature, the corals are stressed and they tend to bleach, which is losing their symbionts, which help them photosynthesize. Um, and that often then can result in death. It doesn't always does. Sometimes they can recover, but usually it um, after bleaching, quite often it does lead to death, and certainly at the higher temperatures, that is what happens. Um, with acidification, um, you're losing the structure of the skeleton. So corals are made out of calcium carbonate, and with increasing CO2, it makes the water more acidic, and that acidic water then dissolves calcium and stuff like that. So you have less in the water for them to work with, and it can also dissolve the skeleton itself. Um. One thing I was wondering also was, how did you uh, get into uh, coral reef research yourself? I started out with um, Sophie in Ove's lab, actually. Mm. Um, I undertook my undergrad at the University of Queensland, and I was looking for an honours project to undertake. And um, Sophie had advertised for an honours project looking at the effects of nitrogen on corals. Um, so I thought it sounded interesting, so I approached Sophie, and um, she was happy to take me on board. Um, I then undertook honours with the lab and then went on to do my PhD. Um, and then through that, when I was finished the PhD, I was looking for a job. Lab manager came up for the lab and I very happily got that position, so yeah. Prior to your honours year, were you already attracted to, to marine biology or to, to coral research in any way? Well, I've always loved the ocean. Um, so I decided to do a Bachelor of Marine Studies. So focus on the ocean in general. I hadn't thought so much about coral in particular. Um, as with most people, it was the cute furry mammals and, well, not so much furry in the water, but <laughs> <laughs> the lovely mammals and turtles and big things. But then when you get into it and you really see what's out there, it's the little things, you know, that live on the reef and out there that really is what gives it the diversity and the amazing abundance and colour that's out there. And, you know, a lot of that is in the reefs. So, yeah, studying them and looking at them. It's just never ending what you can see and learn from them. It's great. Mm. And I guess your research is finding that those little things uh, are just an important part of the food chain and, and what happens to them then affects the rest of the ecosystem. Definitely. Everything is interconnected, you know. Um, you have your keystone species where you take out one the whole lot tumbles. But when you're talking about big scale changes that we are here, you're talking about taking out many species. So even without taking out the keystone species, knocking out that number of species is going to have dramatic effects on the entire ecosystem out there. Yeah. Um, would you have any uh, tips for scientists who are looking to communicate what's happening to, to coral reefs and, and happening uh, about climate change in general? Uh, do you have any tips for communicating the science? Get it out there. Talk to as many people as you can. You know, um, 
talking to your friends and neighbours is great, talking to family, but you know, when you just meet other people and if it happens to come up in conversation, it's great to share it then, you know, just general awareness of what's happening um, so that you understand where we're at and then communicating that to others as you go along. Do you, um, could you uh, uh, give a, a short statement about how humans are affecting climate change, if you had to summarise it in a, in a short... That's a tough one. Yeah, it is a one. <laughs> and, and possibly from the point of view of, of your research, what, what's your been experience and what have you seen? Well, I've seen effects even on Heron Island from the effect. The thing with um, humans and the impacts on coral reefs is we're affecting them in so many different ways. It's not just increasing um, the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's the way we fish, it's how much we fish, it's what we're putting into our streams that then run into the oceans. There are so many impacts that we're having that the accumulative effect is really severe. So you're not just looking at one thing, which potentially, you know, they could survive. You're putting so much stress on them um, as we grow in the coastal communities mm. and everything like that. So for me, it's not just one thing, it's a whole heap of effects that are happening to the coral all at once.